you look at restorationists look at a landscape and they think they dream on it they, they they dream about ecologically what could be happening in that place and so it's this kind of like foresight you know you do a visioning you're visioning something so if you could actually vision in, in where, whatever place you are what would you like to see in terms of human relations on a place in 20 years and then backcast and think what seeds do we need to be planting right now part of you know part of how we know each other is through telling stories from our lives and the way we have stories to tell us that we have experiences you know and and we learn a lot through storied knowledge when I was doing interviews, I found that when people started speaking in metaphor, that's when stuff got really interesting. Because we use metaphor to talk about things that have truth larger than just the thing that we're talking about. Um, and when people started to describe stories in real detail, right, um, and their emotion came into it, they get more creative with their language. and. When people use metaphor, or when they start to use that kind of language, they're pointing to almost like a poetic knowledge of the world that's rooted in wisdom, right? You know, in that in that we build a web and a and a reciprocity with land and water when we when we know it in the way that it's a character in our stories and we're a character in its story. I, I realize I'm just so veering into kind of the symbolic, but. I think dam removals are just the most compelling restoration project because it is, they are just so, it's like such pure symbolism, <laughs> you know, in, in sort of a romantic way, but it's just, I mean, in terms of a, in terms of the kind of restoration that can capture people's imaginations, I just think that they're, they're so powerful for that reason. Ready? Ready. One, two, three, jump! For a long time in North America, especially in the West, we've told ourselves a singular, unshakable story about dams. In many ways, it's a love story, full of romance and conflict usually pitting the indomitable will of man against the chaos of nature. Wild rivers, which epitomize the unpredictable, untapped resource, are transformed by human ingenuity for the betterment of all. By constructing dams, we can produce clean energy for burgeoning communities, create recreational areas for boaters and weekenders, and provide a dependable water source for industry and agriculture. And construct dams we did beginning in the 1890s, accelerating through Roosevelt's New Deal, spreading out to every corner of the world and culminating in the monumental Three Gorges Dam on the Yangtze River in China. Humanity is smack dab in the center of a dam building craze that shows little signs of abating. Even now, a new era of dam construction has begun worldwide, fueled by the demand for clean energy and the hunt for the few remaining wild rivers yet to be tamed and harnessed. The controversial Site C Dam on the Peace River in northern British Columbia is just one example of the latest wave of mega-projects across the globe. This story of man's triumph over nature and the marvels of human ingenuity and audacity is a powerful one, deeply rooted in our collective imagination. But it isn't the only story being told about dams here in North America. Right now, up and down the Pacific coast and beyond, there's a growing awareness of the ecological and social costs of dam construction. Costs that, until recently, have been overshadowed by the sheer marvel of our technological achievements. And little by little, bit by bit, this second story is eroding away the foundations of the first, eating away at its themes, its plot points, creating cracks, which then become fissures, until... The floodgates open! And damn metaphors aside, all hell breaks loose. I think we've seen how strong the passions are today about uh, about water and 
Water is our lifeblood. What do I think of this? I think it's a damn scam. This has gone on and on uh, for years. This bright idea here has a potential of destroying our way of life in the economy. Native American tribes, farmers, fishermen, and conservation groups battled each other over access and control of scarce water supplies in the region. Billion dollars of taxpayer and ratepayer costs, all driven, we are told, by the best available science. It's really a, a, a tragedy, and, and it's government-imposed. Intentional falsification of scientific data. Reliable, sustainable, low-cost power. 68,000 dead salmon can't be wrong. Dams kill fish. There's no salmon in our river. We all grew up eating fish, catching fish, and now there's nothing. It's not getting any better. Bring down the dams. Bring down the dams. I respect the strength of your convictions. We agree that decisions like this must, must be done in tandem and in concert with Indigenous peoples, but those challenges have passed. So, if restoring a landscape or a river requires restoring that landscape or river, what are the stories that we're going to tell to ourselves and to our kids and grandkids about dams? In this two-part series, we're going to look at the stories of two rivers, one in Washington and one in Northern California, and what the decades-long battles to restore them can tell us about the future of rivers and the communities that rely on them. This is part one, which we've decided to call Swimming Upstream. Broadcasting from Vancouver, British Columbia, on the unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh peoples. This is Future Ecologies, where your hosts, Adam Huggins and Mendel Skolsky, explore the future of human habitation on planet Earth through ecology, design, and sound. And from the spawning ground, it's the one that we all know. At one time or another, we all swam from the same hole. That's when my water broke. That's when my father spoke. He said, when I was young, I was told, know how the water tastes, know which way it flows. Feel the wind, know which way it blows. Learn from the animals, the birds and the bees. Say a prayer for the home ground, the rivers, the rocks, the mountains, the oceans and trees. Imagine for a second that you are a Pacific salmon, far out at sea. You are a king salmon, also known as a Chinook. Onkarinkus, meaning hooked nose in Greek, Chaicha, a Russian reference to Chinook. And I want you to imagine that you're a king among king salmon. You're five feet long, a hundred pounds and you've been terrorizing smaller fishes and zooplankton in the North Pacific for over four years, since just a few weeks after you hatched in a riffle up some distant river. Every nautical mile you've swum has taken you further and further from that river, out into the unknown, the majestic Northern Pacific Ocean. You've spent years gorging on krill and copepods, herring and rockfish, You've grown, you're plump, fat, and swimming free. But something feels missing. You're the only one of your hundreds of brothers and sisters to have survived this far. Most were eaten by something long ago. And your parents died weeks before you hatched. You're completely alone. But from the depths of that hole in your fishy heart, there comes a faint remembrance. It stirs within you, transforming your sadness into conviction, your despondency into determination, your paralysis into motion. You are beginning the great migration the defining event of your existence, the test of your strength and your fat reserves. 
you are returning from whence you came. It's still a bit of a mystery how salmon do this, but a recent publication on sockeye salmon in the Fraser River suggests that salmon navigate their way towards the river they were born in using, at least in part, the Earth's magnetic field. From there, it appears they use olfactory and other sensory clues to find their natal stream. But this is a mystery for another day. Today, I'm gonna ask you to join me one more time in the northwest corner of California, known as the Klamath Knot. And this time, Senator Jeff Merkley of Oregon is going to help me tell you all about it. Mr. President, I rise tonight to tell you a tale about the Klamath Basin and share a little bit of the vision. First, let me tell you about the magical place that is the Klamath Basin. It's in Southern Oregon and Northern California. It's an area of the country that is rich with agricultural resources, and exceptional wildlife populations. And here to tell the story of the Klamath River, local resident Erica Terrence. I'm Erica Terrence, and I was born and raised on the Salmon River, which is 15 miles from here, upriver. Erica is also the Outreach and Development Coordinator for the Mid-Klamath Watershed Council, affectionately known as Mikwik. The Klamath River watershed starts in Oregon. The headwaters are near Crater Lake, and up in the Sprague and Williamson and Wood Rivers um, near Klamath Falls area, Chilliquin area, and it's really volcanic up there. Volcanic, as in the southern end of the Cascades Volcanic Range, which extends from British Columbia in the north down through western Washington and Oregon to Lassen National Park in California. Actually, that's part of what gives the water in the upper Klamath its character that it was really good for spring Chinook salmon. But, but mainly what you find is a lot of farming and ranching communities up there. The basin contains approximately 1,400 family farms and ranches, encompasses over 200,000 acres of farmland irrigated with water from the Klamath River and the Klamath Lake. These farming and ranching communities live mostly in what is referred to as the upper basin. From a geographic perspective, I mean, we often say the Klamath is, is an upside down river basin because unlike most river basins, it's you know, pretty flat and pretty deserty up in the top. And the further down you go, the more densely vegetated, the wetter, the more narrow the river canyon. As the river flows out of the arid plateau of the upper basin, it descends through a series of mountain ranges known collectively as the North Coast or Klamath Ranges of California. This includes the Marble Mountains, the Trinity Alps, and the Siskiyous. This whole region is famous for its incredible botanical diversity. And the lower basin is really rugged, remote country. We've actually been there before in Future Ecologies, in our recent mini-series on fire. So the Klamath cuts its way through these mountains until it reaches the Pacific. And down near the mouth, you don't have a really broad river delta. You have still a pretty tight little bottleneck. When Erica says that the Klamath watershed is upside down, what she means is that usually, a river's headwaters will be somewhere up in a mountain range or something, and begin as a narrow winding stream cutting down through a canyon, before eventually winding its way across a wide, flat plain and emptying out in a broad delta into the ocean. That's kind of the archetypical, hydrological cycle version of a watershed. The Klamath sort of does the opposite. That's one of the things that makes it special. The plains are upstream, the mountains are downstream, and smack dab in the middle, four major dams. So then the Klamath River starts up in southern Oregon and crosses the California-Oregon border um, right around where those large dams are in the system. So those large dams bisect the whole watershed and block off um, more than 100 miles of pretty good salmon habitat. These four dams, Copco 1 and 2, the J.C. Boyle, and the Iron Gate, were constructed between 1918 and 1962 mostly to generate power for the region. So it's about a 300-mile run, the Klamath River. That's pretty long. A um, lot of diverse interests. The further down you come, uh, you know, it starts out with all those farming and ranching communities. Uh, then you have the Karuk tribe's uppermost edge of their territory is Wairika. That's right around the border. And uh, then 
you know, you get down to Happy Camp, Soames, or Leans, that's more um, the center of our service area at Mickwick. And that's a lot more tribal communities, a lot more fishing communities, a lot more watershed restoration going on. Um, and that's really our economic engine these days. And then when you get, you know, out to the mouth, that's Yurok tribal territory and a lot of timber interests still down there. And out on the coast, you have commercial fishermen. So when, you know, in the whole pitched battle to remove dams, what you had often the narrative that, that came out about that was, you know, fishermen versus farms, um, which is a pretty tough place to start. So the long and short of it is, in the lower basin, you have fishermen, the tribes, Karak, Hoopa, and Yurok, and small, tight-knit communities of homesteaders and marijuana growers in the mountains. And in the upper basin, farmers and ranchers, and the Klamath tribes as well. In between, dams. But there's one more critical piece to this puzzle. The Klamath is sometimes referred to as the Western Everglades. The basin attracts 80% of the Pacific Flyway's waterfowl and supports the largest overwintering population of bald eagles anywhere in the lower 48 states. It is also home to one of the most productive salmon river systems in the country. The Klamath historically hosted incredible salmon runs, which the 49ers and early settlers quickly began capitalizing on after giving up their search for gold. And of course, this region has a history long before settlers from the east came to it. It was already inhabited by native communities that had lived in the Klamath Basin for 10,000 years and who have a deep connection to this amazing place. Well, I mean, there's, there's a lot to that. That, of course, is Bill Tripp the Deputy Director of Ecocultural Revitalization for the Carrick Tribe. We spoke to him in our miniseries on fire. Before the dams were built, all the tribes, up and down the river, carefully coordinated the salmon harvest through first salmon ceremonies. Before the salmon ceremony at Amikyatam, just right up here in Soames, before that, no one, no one else fished. And then, you know, after that ceremony was done, then, Runners would would um, go down, and and then the Yurok would build their weir, and then they would start fishing. And but that and they, that made sure that a lot of those first fish that could make it farther in through the system um, could make it. This way, enough of the healthiest fish made it upriver to spawn and ensure the future of the run. And then each tribe would be able to harvest what it needed, ever mindful of the needs of those tribes that were still upstream. At that time, the salmon were so abundant that it was said you could walk across the river. On the backs of buffalo, and that's a reference to when people could walk across the rivers, you know, on the backs of the salmon. They were so densely packed in the rivers that you could literally walk across. It's hard to imagine today that the salmon were so thick you could walk across the river on their backs. And you can understand why all of these tribes, all of these people, relied heavily on salmon year-round. And even so, when the settlers arrived, it seemed like there was just an unlimited amount of fish. That is, of course, until the dams were built. There were millions of salmon, right? And now uh, we're talking like the number of salmon that are supposed to get upstream and spawn is 29,000. And after 29,000, that's when they start allowing people to catch fish. And so, you know, in a good year, you might have 60,000 or something like that, but we often don't see good years. It's such a small number, you know, tribal people can barely feed their families and their elders and are relying on fish from the previous year from the freezer sometimes, which is so um, demoralizing and demeaning and unjust. <laughs> so it's, it's really quite a, quite a change. We've experienced the, the decline in salmon populations is... Um, affects everything here. Just when I was a kid, it always just seemed like we always had plenty of salmon. Um, but it, but even then, from what I understand, as people told stories about, I used to be able to walk across the river on their backs, and and I never did. I remember seeing some really big fish caught. I mean, I ended up like Alaska-sized fish caught in the Klamath River at Ishi Pishy Falls, and you just don't see that anymore. I mean. 
but we did see a couple years there I mean when I was young I never did picture the whole um, walking across the rivers on the back thing um, but there was a couple of years where I saw you know finally in my adult life where where we saw one a one or two week window where I was just there was so many fish you can find that I was like you can imagine what what that was I mean I'd try to you know so many fish that you'd try to dip them out of the falls and you couldn't even get your pulls down through them and it's like <laughs> you know missing them all and you just wonder how could I miss that many fish yeah you don't see that anymore and in the past few years the bottom has fallen out on those low populations for their annual first salmon ceremony in 2017 for the first time the Yurok tribe actually had to purchase salmon for the event from Alaska It's been months out at sea, swimming slowly and steadily towards your destination, and it hasn't been easy avoiding roving pods of killer whales and the beckoning hooks of longline fishermen. But at long last, you catch a familiar scent. Suddenly you know this place, you've been here before, when you were just a smolt. And look, there's some other salmon too. They look different, they must be coho. But over there, Chinook, they're all gathered in a big group together at the mouth of the river. So you head towards them. But as you approach, it becomes hard to breathe. Your gills seize up and you start to overheat. Frantic, you struggle to reach the other Chinook who are all gathered in a pocket of cold, oxygenated water. For most of the past few decades, stakeholders in the upper and lower basins of the Klamath River have been locked in a series of caustic water wars. Now let me tell you that the allocation of water in this basin has always been a source of enormous tension between the farmers and ranchers, the fishermen, both the in-stream fishermen and the offshore fishermen, and the tribes. Tribes want to be assured of their rights to continue fishing practices that they have passed down from generation to generation for thousands of years. Farmers and ranchers want to be sure that they will have water they need to sustain their operations that the families depend on for success. For decades, the tension over water has been accentuated in times of drought, culminating most famously in a standoff in 2001 that made national news. During that 2001 drought, irrigation water for the Klamath Reclamation Project was shut off to protect endangered fish species. Thousands of people gathered at Klamath Falls in sympathy with the farmers. There was civil disobedience, and people were worried about the possibility of violence. Vice President Cheney intervened and guaranteed water deliveries rather than fish protections, and the result was the largest fish kill in U.S. history. Those guys upstream really um, control a lot of what happens downstream. Farmers were so concerned that their crops would die off in such a drought year that they turned off the head gates at the top dam in the system and prevented water from coming downstream. And then, of course, what resulted was this 2002 fish kill. Uh, the main stem, Klamath River, was so warm uh, and stressful for them that they were looking for that little bit of cold water with oxygen in it. And they were all so packed in t- close together that they, you know, one got the disease and they all got the disease. And it was... Uh, close to 80,000 adult salmon that died. And when you put that in perspective with the 29,000 number, it's really a big impact. Meanwhile, agriculture was still damaged. Families saw major losses and some had to sell their farms. There were no real winners. At the time, many people thought these issues were intractable, that the arguments and lawsuits would continue interminably, perhaps for generations to come. But a number of years ago, a group of leaders in the community had the boldness to start rethinking how they framed their quest for water and the water wars. After what seems like a lifetime, you make it to the group of salmon and you can breathe again. The water is cool and there's enough oxygen to catch your breath. 
but as you look around at the other salmon packed into this little lens of water, you notice that they look stressed and ill. Something is wrong. Their gills, they're red and swollen with little white dots, and there's dead brown tissue around the edges. Panic starts to set in, when suddenly a wave of cool water flows over you, and the group disperses, headed upstream. You follow, feeling a sense of relief in this moment, but also trepidation. When cool river water sits in reservoirs in the sun, it heats up and can't hold as much oxygen. And in a drought year, when less water is coming downstream in the first place, and water is still being diverted for agriculture and industry, well, the temperature and oxygen levels in the main stem of the river become lethal, even for strong, relatively temperature-tolerant Chinook salmon. The fish are forced to crowd into the mouths of creeks, where bubbles of cool water can form. But crowding decreases oxygen levels even further and increases the odds of parasite and disease transfer, which increases stress, which increases the odds of parasite and disease transfer, and so on. High temperatures, low oxygen, and stressed fish packed into small areas create conditions that favor the rapid spread of a parasite known as white spot, Ichthyophthirius multifilius, often known as Ick for short. Ick is a ciliate protozoan whose adult stage feeds on the gills and skin of stressed fish, resembling a white spot. It can kill fish within 30 days if secondary infections of columnaris, a freshwater flavobacterium, don't finish the job first. And this is exactly what happened in 2002. Now, as it happened, the 2002 fish kill coincided with the FERC relicensing process. Basically, dams need to be periodically relicensed by the Federal Energy Regulatory Committee in Washington, D.C. to remain in use. And the four dams on the Klamath? They have some problems. Like, they don't have fish ladders, which are required by law. So they're vulnerable. And the lower basin community senses that and takes the opportunity to make a move on them. Basically, I would say that the effort, the campaign to remove four dams on the Klamath started in 2001 when the dams, the license for those dams was up for renewal with the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. And the way that this campaign really catalyzed was a bunch of tribes overcoming their differences in this basin and saying, we're going to get dams out and we need to work together to do it. And so all four tribes who had some significant differences took this trip to sent a delegation to Scotland, right, when those dams were owned by Scottish power. Yes, I did go over there. It was um, interesting. I guess if there was one thing I did was I came up with the idea to use recycled scotch barrels to cook our fish with because you can't, couldn't find firewood. They don't really allow open wood burning. And so there's a ceremony on Calton Hill in, in Edinburgh where they uh, there's a Celtic ceremony every year. And so we end up getting permission from the Celtic people to build a fire on their sacred fireplace. And we got permission from the Scottish government to build a fire there um, to cook fish and feed the people. And so we did. We got a bunch of wild Atlantic salmon and we built a fire we couldn't find wood, and so they were like, wow, what are we going to do, what are we going to do? And so I guess that was probably my my contribution was, well, I, it would seem like there would be recycled scotch barrels around here someplace. <laughs> and sure enough, we have a whole truckload of these little right. oak, uh, scotch, scotch-soaked oak blocks. Turned out pretty good. But just talking to the people there, um, out in front of the shareholders meeting for Scottish Power, um, was you know people were coming up and taking our flyers and one person said he said you know what i'm on a i want one of those and uh he said you know why i want one and i said why he said because these things happen all the time but usually when they do this whole place is littered with flyers he said i've walked up and down the street a couple times while you guys have been out here and i haven't seen a single one on the ground so i want to know what you have to say and i thought that was pretty interesting so it seemed like it was really really well received from the people in in that place and scottish power was so uncomfortable under the microscope that they sold off that you know albatross as fast as they could to 
Mid American Energy, which owns Pacific Horror, which is oh, Mid American Energy is owned by Berkshire Hathaway, owned majority of the shares owned by Warren Buffett. This sale was a major early victory for the tribes, but initially, the new owner, Pacific Horror, isn't super excited about the idea of taking out the dams. After all, they just bought them, so it seems like to bring Pacific Horror to the table, the stars have to align, which isn't exactly what happens. Instead. Hell freezes over after the break. So remember that FERC relicensing process? Well, that process catalyzed a series of discussions between very unlikely bedfellows. Individuals representing parts of the community that had often been bitter enemies together. And they were talking about sitting down and hammering out a different vision for the future to replace the lose-lose water battles of the past with something different. It was a large group of stakeholders out of necessity that had to be at the table for that process. So it was, uh, you know, the four major tribes, so Yurok, Hoopa, Karuk, Klamath tribes at the table, commercial fishing interests and sport fishing interests, handful of environmental groups or conservation groups, whatever you want to call them, government agencies, state, federal, Bureau of Indian Affairs, BLM, BOR, Bureau of Reclamation had a lot to say about it because they're so entrenched in how water is managed in the West. Of course, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, they're really involved in all the biological opinions about what salmon need in rivers. And then, of course, agricultural interests were at the table, too. So you had federal irrigation districts and uh, you had individual farming and ranching interests at the table. So that was a lot of pretty diverse needs and interests. Leaders from many different parts of the community sitting down together because, as they said to me, you know, Senator, the only folks who are winning right now are the lawyers. A lot of things went out on the table pretty quickly, right? I mean, for example, Pacific Corps doesn't want any liability for removing dams, and U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service has legal obligations to protect salmon, but they're also, you know, responsible for having created these federal irrigation districts and kind of caring for those irrigation districts' interests. And obviously tribes had already been fighting tooth and nail and had, you know, for more water in the river, enough to prevent fish kills like the one that happened in 2002. As we say in the West, whiskey, that's for drinking, and water, that's for fighting. But these folks said, we are going to pursue a different path. And I pledged that if they were able to develop a solution, I would do everything I could at the federal level to help implement it. So when I got in there, even though I had grown up here and was familiar with the place in some ways and the communities in some ways, it was just a whole new world of a lot of lessons in politics, like a crash course in politics. And, you know, I spent a lot of time listening and kind of interviewing people at the breaks. You know, we would like break for a caucus for, for all the environmental groups to get on the same page or the tribal reps or, or the ag guys to figure out how they wanted to respond to something. And I would be busy like pulling people aside and just trying to understand their perspectives to the point where I could form my own opinion about is the settlement good, is it bad, is it good enough? Like I said, they were not without contention. I, I ultimately raised the money and hired a couple of hydrologists to analyze those water models to make sure that there would be enough water in the river for fish. They were running these really complex models to try to figure out how can we come up with water, additional water basically, right? And, you know, a lot of the negotiating gets done at the bar afterwards. It was a big lesson. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and, I mean, you know, a lot of that is about building trust. And, you know, if you, if you are going to the bar with the guy that used to be your enemy, you can't probably completely hate him, you know? It's really about, like, finding the inefficiencies in the system, you know? You can't, like, make more water. And whether there's enough to go around... It has partly to do with how much you trust each other and how much you're willing to like talk to your neighbor and take less than you think you should get just so the other guy gets by too. But even with the stakeholders willing to take risks and come together to manage the system collectively, 
there was still no guarantee that there'd really be enough water to support the salmon. You need a minimum flow. There's like a floor number for fish to survive. And bi fish biologists at the tribes were looking at that and saying, it's really not about the number. It's about getting the fluctuation in the hydrograph, right? So you need the big water years in the winter to scour out the disease and the algae on the rocks and to rearrange all the gravels that fish are gonna spawn in and to blow certain holes out and build gravel bars and rock bars in other places and create structure and complexity in a stream channel. That's really essential. You are swimming upriver now and the water is just bearable. It's tough going, but this is what you were born to do, and every fiber of your being is bent on working your way upstream, back to that riffle where you first came into the world. Suddenly though, the water around you is filled with big chunks of green goo, giving the water an ugly smell and clouding up the way forward. As you swim, little bits of it break off and hang on your scales, trailing behind you. It's coating all of the rocks along the side of the river and even spreading into the central flow. Toxic algae blooms have become a pretty common occurrence in the Klamath River. Locals are used to being able to swim in the river in the springtime, but by June, the algae builds up to levels that make the river pretty uninviting. Most folks will head to cooler tributaries to swim in the summertime, the same places where coho salmon tend to find refuge from the higher temperatures that exist in the main stem of the river and a water quality problem that became a centerpiece of the campaign to get the dams out was this toxic algae, this bright green uh, microcystis aeruginosa is the Latin name for it. And it, it's an algae bloom that produces a liver toxin, a hepatotoxin, and that can affect a person, a dog, a deer drinking from the river, um, a fisherman, whatever, you know. And it isn't something that will kill you right away, but it bioaccumulates in your liver. Um, and can take years off your life. That algae species was found at levels 4,000 times higher than the World Health Organization said was a moderate health risk. Because of solar radiation in those reservoirs, it's just a bathtub environment, right? It's the perfect conditions for that algae to thrive. You might get a little bit of it in a free-flowing wild river, you know, but very minimal amount, and then it's, it's filtering itself a lot more, right? Sometimes you look at that river and you know you wouldn't want to get in it. You don't have to be a water quality scientist or work at the World Health Organization to know like, nope, I should not swim in that. After years of negotiations, almost a decade, in 2010, this large group of stakeholders come to an agreement that they can all get behind. So these stakeholders have developed a collaborative agreement and signed it called the Klamath Basin Restoration Agreement, or KBRA. The irrigators commit to reducing the total amount of water they take from the river through a variety of conservation practices. They're working collaboratively with the community and their tribes to restore habitat. In exchange, they get certainty and predictability for guaranteed amounts of water. The tribes and conservation groups and fishing organizations agree to stop challenging these irrigators' water allocations. In exchange, they get a community partner to restore natural resources that are of cultural and economic importance to the tribe and to help them reacquire some of the land they lost 50 years ago. Complementing all of this and augmenting the natural resource restoration is a plan to remove four antiquated dams and open up new habitat for fish. Around the same time, Pacificor decides that taking out all the dams is in its best interest as well. The private utility that owns these dams agrees that the best business decision is to remove these dams. So this is a win-win situation, or actually a win-win-win-win situation. Everything is set, the agreements are made, all that needs to happen now is congressional approval. So the agreements needed congressional approval because some of the parties to the agreements were federal agencies, right? This was in 2010, the year Republicans took the House on the back of the Tea Party, and Congress decided to obstruct pretty much everything. The development of the Klamath Basin Restoration Agreement is a historic step forward for the region. And if it were already in place, it would provide a powerful set of collaborative tools for dealing 
with droughts, for dealing with years when there is a shortage of water. But Congress has not yet acted, and those tools are not in place. So again, that was Senator Jeff Merkley of Oregon trying to convince Congress in 2010 to support the agreement. But no dice. Some of the major roadblocks were these very ideological, entrenched folks in Siskiyou County who support dams on principle. And even though these dams are hydroelectric dams, they don't provide any irrigation water, they don't provide any flood control. In fact, probably the opposite. They're kind of risky. They're still very opposed to dam removal, and I I don't see that changing anytime soon. Some of them, their, their parents or their grandparents worked on building those dams, and it's just very hard to let go of dams representing progress. And, uh, you know, there's that myth of dam. I mean, there are good dams and bad dams for sure. On a much smaller scale, dams can be fine. But that myth of, you know, clean green energy coming from dams of this size. And th- that power is easily replaceable by energy that would be at least as clean and green. <laughs> much cleaner and greener, in fact. And so, these vocal constituents and their Republican representatives in Congress were able to prevent congressional ratification of the deal in 2010, and 2011, and 2012, 2013, 2014, and finally, in 2015, time had run out for the KBRA. The deal was set to expire completely if Congress ignored it again. And just imagine, this agreement with roots in a historic water crisis and fish kill at the dawn of the new millennium that has been painstakingly hammered out and finally signed in 2010, nearly a decade later. This agreement, sitting for five years in Congress while the original stakeholders experienced drought year after brutal drought year on the Klamath, and with fish populations dwindling, this agreement was about to fall apart. Here's Senator Merkley in 2014 making his final desperate appeal. The Energy and Natural Resource Committee voted the bill out of committee on a bipartisan basis. The Klamath County Chamber of Commerce has endorsed the bill. The Klamath County Farm Bureau has endorsed the bill. The Klamath County Cattlemen's Association and the statewide Oregon Cattlemen's Association have endorsed the bill. The Klamath Falls City Council has endorsed the bill and the Oregon Water Resources Congress has endorsed the bill. The Senate has been ready to act, but the U.S. House of Representatives has not. And so here we are in the last days of this Congress, unable to complete this bill. They have done everything we could have ever asked a group to do to prepare for this legislation to be passed. But that cannot last forever. Congress has to act to seal the deal. Without cooperation, This vision, so carefully, diligently, and painfully constructed over years of involvement by community stakeholders, will fall apart. This opportunity might not come again. And Congress did nothing. Muscles burning. You forge ahead through algae-filled water. You've avoided parasites, predators, and suffocation. You are a king among king salmon, after all. And as you swim, you imagine the beautiful gravel beds in the tributary stream where you hatched. You imagine the mates that you'll find there and the thousands of fertilized eggs you'll produce together. You imagine... But you're gonna have to hold that thought because the dams are still there. Well, as I said, um, fish can no longer get to that upper 100 plus miles of habitat. It's really great habitat, especially for spring chinook, a lot of tributaries that they would have utilized quite a bit. So for now, everything is hanging in the balance. For right now, what we're doing is this kind of stopgap, like keep coho alive by building them these little ponds that they can survive in, you know, or, but ultimately what we need is this bigger scale work, you know, that can only happen with dam removal. But there is some hope on the horizon. And next episode, we're heading up to the Olympic Peninsula in Washington to see what might be possible for rivers like the Klamath. One, two, three, jump! jump! Thanks for listening. 
We'll be back in a couple of weeks. Please tell everyone you know. Subscribe, rate, and review the show wherever podcasts can be found. It really helps us get the word out. In this episode, you heard Ryan Hilberts, Erica Terrence, Bill Tripp, and Senator Jeff Merkley via C-SPAN. This has been an independent production of Future Ecologies. Our first season is supported in part by the Vancouver Foundation. If you'd like to help us make the show, you can support us on Patreon. We have a whole series of mini-episodes available to our supporters. To get access to them, head to patreon.com slash futureecologies. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and iNaturalist. The handle is always Future Ecologies. Special thanks to Jose Izardia, Christy Johnston Monroe Cameron, Ilana Fenaryov, and Andrzej Kozlowski. Music in this episode was produced by Brian D. Tripp, Loam Zoku, Kieran Fearing, Sour Gout, The Western Family String Band, The Clan Stewart Pipe Band, and Sunfish Moonlight. You can find a full list of musical credits, show notes, and links on our website, futureecologies.net. Finally, we'd like to extend our extra special thanks to Skylar Lindbergh and Vincent Van Haff for untangling some seriously garbled audio for us. We could not have done this episode without you. Thank you. Oh, barnacles. Oh, yeah. oh that's great. Yeah! Oh. Oh, I feel so... <laughs> I feel so good. <laughs> no. Sorry, I, I keep forgetting I'm not supposed to make noise. I think I've just been introduced on your podcast. <laughs> Did you scream during the jump? Yes! <laughs> oh my god. We'll have to do it again then. <laughs> I could do that one more. You've already done it once. Okay, I'll be quiet. <laughs>